Hi, uh, this is Smriti, and I'm very happy to be here um, as a part of Girls' Day as a guest speaker. It's um, it's a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to other presentations as well. Um, really excited to be here. So, first, maybe a quick introduction about myself. So, I'm currently the head of artificial intelligence at Earth Bank where I'm working on um, AI and remote sensing to measure carbon sequestered in a biodiversity. I'm also a director at AI for Diversity, which is the world's largest uh, nonprofit global initiative, which engages and educates diverse communities within artificial intelligence to benefit from the global society, to um, increase a more diverse representation and participation in AI. Um, but before all of this, I worked as a researcher at KDH Royal Institute of Technology, um, Stockholm, Sweden, where I worked on understanding um, how human brain works, like how people process memory, why people lose memory in diseases like amnesia and dementia, etc. Um, and all of that was done using recurrent neural networks and sequence learning. And that's what I'll discuss today. So that's the topic of what we are going to do. And uh, it's called the consciousness of artificial intelligence. There was a unique uh, sequential quality which is shared by many brain activities um, displayed in behavior, cognition, and any sort of neuronal activity at various levels of human uh, neural system structure. So um, here in what I'm going to share today and the experiment that we did at KTH, the um, Royal Institute of Technology, we are interested in finding more about the dynamical and functional implications of an associate um, synaptic learning mechanism, driving sequence learning at a more mesoscopic network level. So here we used a non-spiking attractor memory neural network with a Hebbian-like Bayesian confidence propagating neural network, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Um, so we use this PCPN and learning rule to achieve this. And the suggested network basically can store and recreate temporal activities of input. Um, and it can also govern dynamics internally by modulating gain. So I'll share a couple of things on how we worked during the project, what is PCPN and what it consists of, um, what are the different types of overlapping that happens in the human brain, which is extremely important to understand if we want to ever, you know, um, put a step forward and learn more about how people process memory in general. So, um, yeah, so let's, let's discuss what BCPN is. So, uh, Bayesian confidence propagating neural networks, it's basically um, a type of neural network which is used in this particular model. So, BCPNN is, um, as I said, a type of artificial neural network which is influenced by the Bayes theorem in probability. Um, and this algorithm necessarily views um, everything as neural compute, computation and processing um, as probabilistic inference. So the fundamental model essentially is a feed-forward neural network model, which is composed of continuous activation neural units, which is coupled by Bayesian weights in the form of point-wise mutual information. This particular model was proposed by Anders Lanzner and Orion Ekeberi at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. So uh, this probabilistic neural network model can also be run in gen regenerative mode to produce spontaneous activations in temporal sequences. And that's the prime reason why we um, use this model in our research. So uh, VCPNN can be used for like various applications. Um, it has been used for some machine learning classification, data mining, um, discovery of adverse drug reactions, um, understanding more about 
the biological synaptic plasticity and intrinsic excitability of large scale spiking neural network models etc so uh, the next thing that comes into our mind is what is bcpnn made of right so um, essentially bcpnn comprises of many columns and hypercolumns and um in terms of you know like many columns and hypercolumns the bcpnn network is pretty modular this modular structure is inspired by the extended version or extended form of the mammalian cortex uh, modular structure so uh, many columns are the smallest abstract units possible so if you look at the image that's here on the screen the, what you see is a hypercolumn and the small circles that you see consider them to be many columns for now so a hypercolumn basically is a collection of neurons in the brain's vertex that may be pierced uh, sequentially by a probe which is placed perpendicular to the cortical surface and that has almost similar receptive fields it is basically a collection of nerve cells in the brain that aids to the interpretation of visual inputs by letting us examine their size uh, speed shape direction anything um according to estimates a hypercolumn has between 50 to 100 cortical mini columns present inside them and each of uh, the mini columns each of the particular mini columns they contain like contain of like 80 neurons in general so um basically the model that we're discussing here we describe this model as capable of learning remembering interpreting sequential activity in the context of earlier work on cortical attractor memory modeling so we used a population model of the cortex in which the units represent neuronal aggregations which is the cortical columns essentially which is the same as hypercolumns so the hypercolumns here um it works on a winner takes all basis like a winner takes all dynamics to maintain the module level activity normalization in general so um here is the models like topological arrangement which you can see so the circuit basically employs attractor dynamics which direct uh, which directs the network's stored patterns the pattern themselves are determined by self recurrent um, connections once they are triggered they tend to keep a pattern in place so naturally the patterns may be thought of a cell assembly spread over networks hypercolumns um and that happens because the winner take all mechanism confines the activity of the units of the hypercolumns ensuring sparse activity so therefore you see a sequential pattern happening here like a sequential pattern activation which is created through the speed forward excitation in general so that's basically how um, you know the network would work the hypercolumn the bcpnn in general um also another thing is that so previously published work on attractor um, models show shown that it is feasible to store attractor states using overlapping representations that that is pattern that have a shared unit activation in some hypercolumns so um basically i have already explained how um the connections in hypercolumns work so as i said it's a um feed forward neural network which works on a w like winner takes all mechanism so this is you can see how it's you know like you basically have one connection which is enabled at a time which is the excitation and then you have the inhibition which is non which is the network that's not active at a particular point so next we discuss um overlapping in the sequences so um sometimes what happens is the patterns they have a shared unit activation in some hypercolumns and it's extremely important to analyze how um the overlapping is happening and what's the different types of overlapping 
So we examine here whether a network is capable of effectively storing and recalling overlapping patterns or not, and when um, when they are associated with sequences and remembered as such. This is useful since it expands our network storage capacity and enriches the um, you know like several different combinations and patterns that our network can analyze eventually. So our objective is to describe our network's ability to store and effectively recall sequences, including the patterns that overlap. Given that uh, sequences might include more than two overlapping patterns in general, we suggest following um, two parameters as a framework for parametrizing the issue uh, more systematically. So the first parameter that we are going to consider is the um, the spatial measure of overlap. So this would be the degree of overlap between two patterns. Um, and then the second parameter that we are going to consider is a more temporal metric of overlap, which estimates the number of patterns that exist in some degree of representation, uh, representational overlap between two sequences. Um, so the one that basically measures the spatial measure of overlap is um, known as the representational um, overlap. And then the second one, which measures the temporal aspect of overlap is the sequential overlap. So the overall concept um, is seen in this figure that we can see here right now, where the two parameters, the representational overlap um, in black, that shows that uh, how much overlap is basically happening between the two units and sequential overlap, which is represented in gray here, um, which shows the number of units that's basically um, overlapping the, the degree of disambiguation in this case. So to be more specific, the percentage, um, a ratio of hypercolumns that share the same units between two patterns are denoted as representational overlap. And we define sequential overlap as the number of patterns in two sequences that have some degree of similarity. So this is um, another example. So this consists of six patterns, that is um, six uh, different sequences. So with their patterns dispersed throughout three different hyper columns. So um, the two sequences are uh, the share two pairs of patterns, which we can see here as P3A, P3B, um, P4A, and P4B, which is visible in this image. So we have a sequential overlap of two as seen by the gray region um, in the figure that's there in the image. When we compare the patterns P3A, um, it's 12, 3, and 3. And when we look at P3B, it's 3, 3, 3. So we see that they both have the same um, unit activation in the last two hypercolumns, the hypercolumn 2 and hypercolumn 3 implying that the pair has a representational overlap, um, two, three. In the next figure, you can see the units in the hypercolumns that are responsible for the pair's uh, representational overlap as marked in black here. So the representational overlap parameter is a value between zero and one, but the sequential uh, overlap parameter is unlimited value since the sequences can be infinite, infinitely long. The domain of sequence disambiguation is the limit situation in representational overlap, and hence it's equal to one. Um, we see here that, you know, like we provide a more schematic depiction of the disambiguation issue, where a representational overlap of one indicates the equivalence of both patterns in the sequential overlap section. The sequential overlap in this regime is a more proportional um, aspect to the size of the disambiguation window and that network must span in order to successfully disambiguate the sequence, which we can see here um, basically in strictest sense, uh, solving this sequence disambiguation needs the network to be able to maintain the contextual information necessary to appropriately resolve the bifurcation that's happening here. 
and at the conclusion of the overlapping segment that is um the network must retain information which pattern was active prior to the disambiguation window for the duration of the sequence so um that's um it about the overlapping of the sequence and other than more computational neuro, uh, neuroscience aspects i also wanted to very quickly discuss another very important concept um which is artificial empathy so artificial empathy or computational empathy is the development of ai systems which can detect and uh, respond to human emotions in a more empathetic way um empathy is in general the ability to understand and feel what the other person is experiencing by putting oneself in others position and can be of different types completely so one might ask if it's encouraging or terrifying i would say that even though such technology can initially be perceived as threatening by many people um it has some very interesting use cases in the healthcare sector from the caregiver's perspective if we look at it um caring for mental health patients is emotionally difficult for nurses and doctors doctors and nurses uh, they find this constantly reported feeling burnt out performing emotional uh, labor above and beyond the requirements of paid labor which compromises the quality of care um ai robots can here be um, employed to basically take care of the patients more empathetically um for maybe taking care of patients who are suffering from dementia um without really feeling burnt out so ai robots can use empathy to care for dementia patients without feeling burnt out they can be um you know like the go to between the doctors and nurses and their patients they can work very closely with doctors to gather information and refine treatment plans they can work with nurses to monitor patients and engage um in day to day care as well at the same time dementia patients who have been um at the same time dementia patients who receive constant empathetic care they report better outcomes in general also according to the emotional um intelligence pyramid empathy is in all layers of the upper uh, pyramid above emotion recognition this addresses the missing apex of maslow's hierarchy which you can see here on the screen after the top of maslow's hierarchy of self actualization there needs to be a uh, self transcendence and emotional unity um basically the maslow's hierarchy of self actualization represents the highest level or stage in his model of human motivation um the hierarchy of needs according to the hierarchy of needs self actualization represents the highest order motivations which drive us to realize our full potential and achieve our you know ideal self so um basically there are three parts of empathy that describe um empathy to us which is cognitive empathy effective empathy and somatic empathy when it comes to ai moving towards uh, a more human like intelligence empathy can be essential since human intelligence is different from artificial intelligence human empathy has to be different from artificial empathy uh and empathy can be learned and ai can surely be equipped with artificial artificial empathy in the years to come um however it could be scary if not used cautiously therefore ethics is extremely important in artificial intelligence especially when we are working towards such use cases that we discussed today so that's it from me um if anyone's um interested in connecting further feel free to and i'm looking forward to your answering any questions that you may have thank you